Yes, yeah, welcome to the, the second session. Uh, develop a tool, no longer a phrase that was used to bully me in the schoolyard. It's a key part <laughs> of web development. It's difficult to imagine how we survived through a period where you know, all we could do is play a game of higher or lower with, with alerts. I mean, that's how I first started debugging. And browser error messages were, you know, at best, indistinguish indistinguishable uh, from stoner philosophy, you know, things like undefined is not defined. Yeah, thank you for us. Uh, too many arguments. Just everyone, everyone chill out. Uh, but what of the future? You know, where, where, can we, where can we take this? Well, I'm joined by this panel of developers developing developer tools with developer tools for developers. Uh, they are Kenneth Auschenberg uh, started Remote Debug, an effort to unify remote debugging uh, tools. Henry Bergius, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong already, sorry, uh, founder of NoFlow, the Kickstarter-based visual flow-based web development environment. Uh, we've got NJ, the instigator of Brackets, uh, Adobe's code editor built off the back of web technologies. Uh, representing the browsers, we've got Joe Walker, who's working on uh, Mozilla's new and shiny uh, developer tools. Uh, we've got Pavel Feldman, who's working on uh, the, the Chrome developer tools. And to start us off with some words about things, a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Okay, big up to my Chrome boy, it's Paul Irish. <laughs> All right. Um, Brad, thank you. So uh, I want to give you a brief overview of kind of where we're at in web developer tooling. Um, uh, if we can get my slides up, we'll be good. Um, there's been a lot of iteration and movement lately, um, but I wanted to first kind of bring us back into kind of the history of... Uh, just a moment. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not me. It's that, it's that computer. Andrew? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, it's right. It's right. There you go. Love it. All right, thank you guys. I'm going to give you a quick overview of where we're at with web developer tooling. Um, but to do that, I want to head back and talk into the history. Uh, back in 2006, Hixie, the editor of the HTML5 spec, he was kind of testing out how HTML5, how HTML is parsed, and he kind of he he wrote a tool. Um, and this tool came out to be uh, first he was like diagramming how DOM is constructed based off of HTML. And he's like, you know, I can create this live DOM viewer. And so here is the DOM view of, of what we've constructed with, you know, in this case, uh, just a quick P tag, right? That's our, our, our DOM. And then it just so happened that only three months later, uh, this guy basically debuted. Just three months later, Joe Hewitt released these uh, initial screenshots of Firebug, um, kind of leading us to this, uh, the, the angle brackets representation of the DOM that we know and love and see every day. Now, um, I do want to shout out to the more OG, uh, the OG developer tool. This is Venkman, the JavaScript debugger inside of Firefox. This debuted around 2001. Um, so it's really kind of the first thing. But since then, there's been a lot of movement. So fast forwarding now, I want to show you where some of the uh, developer tools are these days. So first, over on Firefox, there's been some fantastic things happening. I'm going to show a quick preview of what things look like with the WebGL shader editor. So what we have here is a, uh, sh a WebGL scene, and we are live editing a uh, GLSL shader. I'm kind of changing some of the dimensions of this. One of the really nice aspects I like about this editing environment is uh, as we live edit it and make some mistakes, we actually get feedback on um, invalid uh, validation errors that, are that we are triggering in the GLSL. Now moving outside of that, um, there's been a lot of fantastic work. This is a screen, uh, screenshot of some new upcoming work from the memory tooling inside of Firefox developer tools. Um, heap snapshotting and showing what, what's going on inside of the memory. Um, you might have seen this. This is a, a nice visualization of what's happening with, with CSS transforms. Really fantastic to understand how exactly the original shape is being modified through transforms. Um, also, this is fantastic work. We're going to stop here at a breakpoint, but we understand the various scopes that are active and see, for instance, how a certain variable may have been available in a previous scope, but has now been overridden, so it gets striked out. And then this was a fantastic experiment 
um, that I don't think has landed yet, but I, I like where it's going. It's uh, audio breakpoints. So basically, kind of like um, uh, hearing when different points in your code get hit. Um, I really like this approach. All right, so over on Chrome DevTools, there's been some fun stuff happening. Uh, you might have seen uh, screencasting. So this is um, an effort to say, hey, we can actually take what's on the screen of your device and show it inside of your desktop browser. Not only can we show it, but also have it interactable. So if, because typing on a phone is pretty slow, we can just type on your keyboard, click around, and all those clicks will be translated into touches onto the device. Then a few more good stuff. Uh, <clears throat> this is a flame chart visualization of the JavaScript profiler, giving you good insight as far as how for, across time uh, your JavaScript is executing, understanding what is sort of the pattern and rhythm of function execution inside the browser. <clears throat> this is uh, device emulation, so emulating uh, not only screen resolution, but device pixel ratio, the viewport uh, configuration, touch events, and doing that all right inside of uh, desktop so that we don't actually have to even go over to the device. Um, and this is a new upcoming feature, uh, asynchronous call stacks. So we can actually see from where we are, where we, how we got there across an XHR and across a set timeout so we can trace all the way back um, in, in that full line. The IE team has been trucking um, ever since the new release of their F12 dev tools. Um, they've done some fantastic work. This is a quick screenshot of where the new uh, network tool is. Really good looking waterfall and a lot of detail in there too. Um, also new to the F12 tools is uh, proper uh, memory heap snapshotting and memory profiling. Um, so here we can take two snapshots, we can compare them, see what's going on. Um, and one of my personal favorites is their new UI responsiveness uh, panel, which gives a lot of insight as, as far as the operations that are happening inside the browser, how that relates to frame rate, so we can uh, help identify how exactly we can improve the performance of the page and reduce the jank. Uh, so Kenneth here uh, from the Remote Debug Project um, showed this fantastic demo over Full Frontal. Um, remote Debug uh, is a fantastic way to basically bridge the gap between different browsers their run times and their, browse, and their browser developer tools. So we actually have Chrome's developer tools interacting with the Firefox browser. Um, not only can we you know, inspect elements, but also change the DOM of Firefox using the Chrome developer tools. And there's a lot more where that came from. NJ from Brackets, uh, I wanted to show this quick and fantastic demo. Um, Brackets has long been doing kind of live CSS development. Um, where you can just change things on the fly, but this is the live HTML development. So as you know, there isn't a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, mapping HTML to DOM is not a trivial thing, but here we are moving around our HTML, our DOM is updating, and we do a quick view into the CSS that applies for this H2 and make those changes on the fly, make it hot pink, because that's the right way to go. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make this demo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, another, Fantastic uh, thing inside of uh, uh, brackets is the Theseus JavaScript debugger. Really powerful work. Um, so here we actually see a, a log across our code of how it actually executed. We had four calls uh, that ent entered into the fetch, and um, we can also see of those four calls that entered in the fetch, two of them went into the air handler, and then we can actually see, oh, we went into the air handler, what was in the air object? We can retroactively look inside of that air object and inspect <laughs> that situation. Henry from NoFlow is here, and I want to quickly show uh, what NoFlow looks like. Uh, it's a new kind of uh, flow-based visual paradigm for, uh, for writing uh, JavaScript applications. Let's see if we can get that video back up. Barely. Well, um, but it kind of turns the, the, the idea that uh, of looking at code um, on its head and, and introduces a much more kind of uh, revolutionary idea for building together rich uh, experiences. All right, so beyond kind of what's represented here on the stage, uh, there's a few other things that are happening inside the ecosystem of browser developer tooling I want to quickly show. The Trace GL project came out a little while ago um, but said, you know, we're just going to log absolutely all the operations that are happening. Um, in this case, we are, we are logging not all this, but we inspect retroactively what happened here, and we can actually see these if statements. They're in red down at the bottom because these conditions were not met. So visually, we see, oh, 
These all failed. We skipped those conditions and we skipped the associated context blocks uh, with them. SpyJS is a similar kind of thing. This has since been acquired by, uh, by the WebStorm and kind of consumed by the WebStorm IDE. But over on the left-hand side, we have all the run loops for different events and then the call stacks that they triggered and then we can identify how exactly uh, we mapped those call stacks into the code. Really nice usable experience. <coughs> this is a project called Earhorn, but you might have seen a similar thing from the light table IDE. Uh, here we map in the runtime information of what's happening inside the browser and bringing that right into the code so we can see on mouse move all these, you know, our client X, our client Y's live updating and we can get a good idea of, of how this, uh, while looking at code, what the state is in the browser. Uh, this is a quick shot of uh, looking at per statement based JavaScript profiling heat map. So we can see by at the statement level or even expression level uh, where our code uh, is, is most expensive. Adobe's been doing some fantastic work inside the browser. This is an experiment for a GUI for editing uh, CSS shapes, so we can move around uh, inside the GUI, and we update the CSS shape polygon that's defined underneath it. And we've seen a fantastic amount of innovation when it comes to all the JavaScript frameworks that are creating better tooling for themselves. So this is a React uh, Chrome extension. Um, on the, it looks like kind of standard dev tools, but it's actually completely representing their kind of application state of the world um, and, uh, and all its properties. And similarly, this is Ember's Chrome extension. Uh, they have a fantastic view of all the promises that are active and, and fulfilled inside the browser. And this is inspiring a lot of browsers themselves as far as how we can better supply uh, good information around some of these new things like uh, promises inside the browser. So to me, like, what is the role of developer tools uh, these days? Uh, you know, allowing us to develop fast at the speed of our thinking, letting us go as quick as we want. Making debugging suck less. None of us want to be debugging. Um, hopefully tools can help us avoid the situation when we are debugging, but when, we, when we're there, it should be easier for us. And web development is hard. Tools can keep, help keep us on the golden path, make sure that things are performant, make sure that things work great across devices, and tools uh, can help fill in the gaps of, our, of the knowledge that we don't have and the things that we forgot. So I think developing for the web, for JavaScript can be better. Everyone on this on the stage believes that has been developing tools, and I'm excited to see what's next. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, Paul's going to duck out now because he's uh, he's got the dreaded illness. I can hear a few people in the room uh, have. So we've got his uh, stunt double Pavel's going to going to fill in on the panel for him. I get, yeah, I can hear a few people coughing. I've, I had it last week as well. Um, I've, I've managed to trace it back talking to some of the employees of GDS who took a trip up to Newcastle, and I hear that that's where, that's where this illness first like, came from. <laughs> so it's a, another valuable addition to the world from Newcastle. Thanks for that, guys. I'm kidding, of course. I love Greg's. Right, first question. Um, <laughs> But before we start, the, um, the, the, these guys are, are developing the, the tools that are supposed to make your lives easier. So if, you, if they say anything you disagree with or there's anything you want uh, to elaborate on, then you know, use OnSlide. If that's not working for you, please just raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll pick you out for a question. Uh, the first question comes from Sebastian Keevy. Where's, where's Sebastian over there? Have you got Sebastian microphone? In the future, can we expect to do all of our development within the browser? Uh, will browser dev DevTools become our full ID, or should we, or should browsers concentrate on interfacing better with IDEs? Hmm. So Macromedia brought a rendering engine to their IDE 17 years ago, but now it feels like browsers are bringing uh, IDEs to the rendering engine, and now we have code editors that are, are written uh, entirely in browser technology. Uh, Joe, I'd like you to come in on this. What do you see? Firefox's DevTools becoming a, a full IDE? So I, th I think nobody would like us to say you're not allowed to use Sublime anymore, uh, or whatever your editor is, or brackets, or brackets, <laughs> yeah. So um, that's not going to happen. Um, on the other hand, there are things that the browser knows about how it's laying stuff out and what values are inside the JavaScript engine that you can only know by being a JavaScript engine, or by being a browser. Uh, so there are times when you will want to edit stuff inside a browser as well. Um, so the answer, I think, is both. Well, NJ, you, your editor is also a browser, right? 
Uh, I wouldn't call it exactly that. I think our goal is to tie more directly, clo more closely to browsers. I mean, exactly what Joe said, which is that um, there are things that only the browser knows about, and browsers, in my opinion, should focus on what they do really well, which is inspection, right? Mm -hmm. They're inspecting the runtime. They can tell us all this information. That information, I think, for quick stuff or you know, when you're really focused on the browser, it makes sense to have tools in the browser, and obviously, you know, that's a great workflow for that. But there's times when you're, what you're really focused on is your coding, right? You're not necessarily, you don't want to live in the browser when what you're doing is writing a bunch of code and you're just trying to get stuff working and you're iterating rapidly on your code. The browser isn't maybe necessarily the best environment for that. So I think what we should really be focusing on for that aspect is to make it so that the browser information is exposed to uh, code editors and other kinds of tooling, you know, NoFlow, whatever, so that we can provide a much richer development experience um, outside of the browser as well, working with the browser. I, I, I agree with you. That's the whole reason why I started Remote Debug. And, and Joe, I actually disagree with you um, <laughs> because, because the browser today has a lot of information that is not exposed to the outer world. But I, I, think, I think that's a problem of the state we're in right now. Um, because frankly, what NJ is building with brackets is that he would love to have that information available to, to write better JavaScript debugging, get information about the DOM, the network stack, all these kind of things. I, I assume you would love to, to pipe them into your editor, but he's not allowed because he cannot get the information. So I, I think the responsibility of, of, of the browser windows is to expose that information, and that's why I think we need to, to start an effort like Remote Debug to unify and build an interface to, to our browsers. So other tooling vendors like brackets, telemetry, benchmarking tools can start accessing that information that right now only privileged tools like built-in div tools and browsers has access to. So there's two different things there. Um, uh, Firefox developer tools work remotely. Mm. They log in through a TCP socket. I know, and yeah. All of that stuff you can get out as well as I can. Mm. So we're not keeping anything private at all. Um, and there's a self-documenting API to get a list of everything that we are talking to. Um, there's a second part to it, and um, uh, that's, I'm sure there's going to be another question on this, which mm -hmm. is, should there be a standard protocol by which we debate? Um, do we want to... I don't want to get into that. That's, that's another question. question. <laughs> I can feel it coming. And <laughs> we'll get there. Well, it, is, is the browser as a... You know, because it has it has the runtime all, all built in, is it in a better position to do things like e even even with code like like autocomplete? I mean, I watch games developers work, and it seems to me that they just write you know a comment to do make Half Life three, and then from then they just hit the tab key. Over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're the best games developers are also the best at track and field the arcade game. Is the browser in a better position to, to do stuff like that? Uh, yes, I mean so. Uh, we've got some stuff that uh, does fairly deep analysis of uh, JavaScript now and will do some fairly clever completions um, that is just landing. Um, I mean, that, to be honest, most of that technology is static, which brackets could do just as easily. Um, but I think there is actually value. In, we did some experiments earlier on. We haven't really done it in brackets around essentially querying the runtime for information. Right. Like if you're stopped at a breakpoint, you right. can just ask it what's available now. And that's there is more cool. stuff there. Yes. And again, we could do that from a code editor as well as long as it's exposed through the runtime. Yeah. I guess the other point I would make, I don't know if I'm getting away from what you were asking, but is that you also want to write other kinds of code besides browser code often. And so having one environment for, hey, here I'm going to do browser stuff, and now I'm going to do my node stuff, and I'm going to do my Ruby stuff or whatever seems a little funny. Um, of course, if you were just doing JavaScript, maybe you could retarget the in-browser developer tools to Node. I mean, you can already do that with Node Inspector and things like that. But I think you know, there's room for lots of different kinds of tools. People have lots of different workflows. They have to work with local command line tools. They have to do this and that. Um, in terms of you know, the browser sort of has its role as a kind of sandbox place where you do browser stuff. And I think that, um, again, I think the solution is you have both kinds of tools and then they talk to each other. Yeah, like I, I don't think like having a contextual div tool with, built into the browser is ruling out having another tool like your editor. But the kind of problem I think by having really specialized browser tools for each browser is that I as a developer, I need to learn a new div tool when I'm targeting another browser. So that means my workflow is kind of broken. Because if I develop for Chrome, I need to use, learn how to use Chrome div tools, navigate this, this, the, the, the source code set uh, breakpoints. If I do it for Firefox, I need to learn their tool. Um, and to me, that's just disconnecting my productivity. So there's a lot we can do to help there. So you'll notice that in Firefox Dev Tools now, the key sequences are the same as in Chrome's. Mm. Um, in our box model highlighter that's just landed, then all of the colors to denote borders, paddings, et cetera, they're the same colors. And IE is exactly the same as well. So there's stuff we can do to help there. If I don't, I think there are many reasons why just saying there should be only one tool 
um, is hard. But that's that old question again, which yeah. we're going to come back to, I'm we'll sure. Well, before we move on to the next question, I, uh, we've got a question from the floor from everyone's favourite shaver, Remington Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on on the uh, the point of kind of you know working with Firefox Dev Tools, working with Chrome Dev Tools, working with IE Tools, so I, I I haven't used the F12 tools yet, and when I look at the uh, the, the, the UI responsiveness, I wonder whether or not that's going to give me more insight to the responsiveness of my web page across all the browsers, or if it's just for that browser, and that's something I'm unsure. If I I mean I'm quite comfortable in Chrome and I can navigate Dev Tools really well, but Am I uh, debugging for Chrome, or am I debugging across the... In most cases, it's bugs, yeah, sure, but for things like performance and responsiveness, um, I have no clue. And do we need all these different tools for e to target each browser? Well, Probably. that actually leads into our next question, so I'm going to get uh, Shane Hudson to, to read it out, because it kind of expands on that yeah, microphone for... <coughs> Should I have a microphone? Hi. So... Um, you rewrote my question for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> initiatives like remote debug look to unify developer tools. Okay. Is this a good thing, or could it hurt the diversity of tooling? That's, so that's this question. That uh, mind, yeah. um, so some people uh, <laughs> 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 would like to just have one tool, um, and obviously many tools are being created. Um, it, and there's a there's a ton of ways in which our tools are specific to what we're doing. Um, so, you know, there's new APIs that we're experimenting with, we need developer tools for that, and we wouldn't expect the Chrome uh, team to provide us with those tools. So, and there are things, you know, there are optimization techniques that will work on one browser that won't work on another. Um, you know, I, I think there are good reasons why we have a, an obligation to tell you about the stuff that is in our browser that's we are the only people that can tell you about it is us. We have that an obligation to do that, and so that's what we're doing. Um, yeah. So uh, on that, uh, if there was a standard way to get that info out of the browsers, then yes. some third party interested in building that kind of profiling tools specific to a given task could yep. easily go and grab the same data, feed, feed the same HTML, JavaScript, whatever to IE, Firefox. Chrome, grab all of those statistics and show, okay, you know, here's how this and this thing performs yeah. in that browser. Yeah. And so we, right now, that's something we don't really have. We definitely don't want to kill innovation. I mean, it's great that you guys are doing different things and you guys are different doing different things. But as you mentioned just now, too, you know, you're trying to make some things the same, right? Because you want the right. UIs to be the same. And for just basic functionality, I want to set a breakpoint, I want to do this, I want to do that. Even the more inspection stuff, it seems like it would be valuable to have at least, at least even at the like, highest, shallowest level, some kind of just basically common protocol just to make it so that we can talk the same way. And then, you know, this browser might have certain extensions for the stuff that it does, and, you know, the other browser might have different extensions for those things. But on places where there really doesn't need to be a huge difference, at least in the core functionality, why not make right. it the same? Well, well I, I would say, Joe, first of all, I don't, I don't just want one tool. I, I really yeah. like that we have multiple tools available. Okay. But as a developer, I don't want to swap between multiple tools just because I'm targeting another browser. I don't want to change my workflow as a developer while I'm crafting a debug in my application and learn new workflows uh, because I'm targeting multiple browsers. And that's the reality as front-end developers today is that we have a bunch of different browser-specific tools that we need to learn, and it's counterproductive. So my, my hope is that um, your workflow isn't that different. You know, setting a breakpoint, you know, that kind of thing is basically uh, very similar. Um, so I'm hoping but that... But why, why, why do we need to do it twice? Once in Firefox DevTools and another, in, another one in, in Chrome DevTools. Right, so, so two different uh, use cases here. There's what Brackets are trying to do, which mm. is uh, to log into our DevTools, set a breakpoint, inspect the variables, that sort of thing. That's one level of difficulty. Mm. There's a whole different level of difficulty, which is make Chrome DevTools work on against Firefox. I know, that's, that's the prototype of the There is a massive, massive difference between those two. Um, and you know what you're getting into trying to do that is all sorts of complicated problems about object lifetime in the browser and you know etc. There's a multitude of problems. It's that there. simple. Um, now, as far as the the case for simple debug goes, so I mean, just think about writing an add-on for a browser, right? So you, you we started off with you know a Firefox add-ons which will do absolutely anything, and then there's a new API that's safer that comes on top of that, and you know then it looks like we're at a state where maybe we could have the, the Chrome 
um, API and the Firefox, you know, Jetpack API. There's some similarity there. Maybe we can extract out standard. Well, that we've feels done like that with Grease Monkey, right? That with feels Grease like Monkey right. That 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 kind of approach of, of you know giving people what they want, you know, everything, filtering it down to what they need, standardizing it. That feels like a good approach, um, and I'm I'm for that kind of process. So but it's hard. Is the yeah. I may add. So it seems like we're all in agreement, so it's boring, right? <laughs> we need to compete to innovate, and nobody's taking that away. Remy, we are sorry. 60 FPS is going to be different on Firefox from Chrome. You need to use different timelines. You need to use IE's timeline, at least for now, because those pipelines are entirely different. Uh, the ADRs you won't see with the Firefox tools. So if you are going for high tech, if you are going for performance, you need to stick with the uh, tools for the browser as of today. Now, talking about the baseline that we've all uh, discussed for a single ID or whatever that will use that baseline, I think that the ball is on your side at this moment. Uh, most or all of the browsers are exposing their protocols as of today. They are different. <coughs> if you try and bridge them on your side and prove that there is a value on bridging them and talking to multiple browsers, there will be an incentive for us to standardize. Otherwise, as browser vendors, we would always want to innovate first and standardize later. And if you, this, this kind of standardization effort that, that you're doing, is this mm. something that you see going to a, a standards body, such as the, the W3 or the WG? Well, well we, we've been discussing that, um, and I, I think it's, it's too early, because frankly, right now, we don't know how to build for the web. We don't know how to build web components. We don't know how to build, uh, build the dev tools. I think what we need to start in agreeing upon is the baseline, like, is our remote debugging, is that going to use HTTP, is it a WebSocket? What, what is the very fundamental protocol? And then we can discuss all the API details, like how is the Firefox API, how is the Chrome API? But the, the problem is, like, if you're, if you're not, not a DevTool developer and you want to interface with the browser, that is so goddamn hard. And, and what I see when I look at what Visual Studio or Adobe are doing, um, then they're sitting and inventing ways to, to do uh, instrumentation to extract information out of the web app so they can protect that information and bring it into, into their editors. And frankly, I think that's a complete waste of time because that's the responsibility of the browser windows. You guys are building the platform. You should enable the ecosystem of tooling vendors we have out there to build tools for the web. Right now, you only allow yourself to build for the web. And, and, and I think that's not good enough. So can I suggest a way forward? And that the way forward here is that we start off with something like a JavaScript API, which allows you to do debugging in a browser, whether that's remotely, whether it's from one web page to another. I mean, that would be pretty cool to, mm. be able to write a, a debugger in a web page to look at the other web pages, security issues, obviously. Um, Ignore the protocol to start off with. Do it by a JavaScript API. That's the way forward. And that is a, a, something that you can build on bit by bit. But that's going to take time. Well, on a, on a related subject, I've uh, got the next question from Remy Sharp again. Uh, <laughs> so we get Remy a microphone. Can we just wire <coughs> Remy up? <Yeah. laughs> so um, my question was rewritten as well. <laughs> I, I just made them more extreme to be more interesting, uh, right? <laughs> um, so currently, so I will read this. Uh, currently, features launch before they have DevTool support, e.g. promises, service and events, web audio, and so on. Is this fair to developers? Should we be ensuring uh, we're developing features that in are inherently debuggable? I don't actually agree with the question you <laughs> 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 but Well, well, well you, you can say you're a bit first if you want. Well, it's, experiments come before standards. Mm. Right, it has to, and that's the only way we're making progress. So. Um, I, it should be debuggable, but I want to be able to get in there and debug it whilst the browsers catch up with me as a developer. Um, so, so, server you, events so you really just simple. answered your own question, so that's... Well, that's no, server center events is a really simple example. We've got tools for debugging WebSockets, but we don't have tools for debugging server center events. Yeah. Um, is that... It, it's, it's hard for us to go ahead and debug that, and why aren't browsers making that easier for us? That question. I don't think we have a, a well-established process of debuggability for new features. Uh, we try to have everything debuggable by the time it leaves experiment or is no longer behind a flag. So uh, Shadow DOM is probably a good example of that. Uh, Shadow DOM appeared, debuggability was there, also behind a flag. And uh, 
promises are already there, but there's no built-in support for them yet. We're working on it. So for us, uh, the measure is uh, future heating stable. That's an absolute requirement for us. Uh, but there's no <coughs> sort of better process, and uh, it's entirely driven by our customers. So if you file bugs about lack of debuggability of experimental features, it gains stars. We will definitely look into it. The, the promises bit is, is really interesting because there's a there's a huge thread in the in the spec discussion about promises where they they were saying we're not going to have a, a dot done method that a lot of other promises have because it, that method is just there for debugging and we shouldn't be putting things into the spec that are just there for debugging. Is that something? Is are, are, how we, are you looking to? What, what's your plan for debugging things like promises? Is it something you're looking at? Uh, yes. Um, so we've got this thing called tag stacks, which is the, the thing that you see in Chrome for uh, looking back through uh, async things. Um, uh, <coughs> I think it would be good to have some way of listing all uh, promises that have been unfulfilled in some way. Um, that would be extremely handy. Um, yeah, we want, we'd like to do this. Just, I mean, I mean, our dev tools are written in JavaScript. So we'd like it for our own purposes, if nothing else. You know, <laughs> so. Um, we're working on it. I, I don't know what more I can say than that. So the, um, I've got a question more for the audience, I guess. Like given, given all these tools we have, like you know, variable watching, breakpoints, who here still uses console.log as their first, first bit of debugging? Yeah. Right. And, 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 I, I, I find, and I do this as well, and I find this crazy, because just writing debugger is less characters. <laughs> and, that, and that would let you in, inspect it. It's like, it's like shaving with a knife you know, when there's a perfectly good razor blade there for you. you know, it's, um, it's, why, 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 do people, why do we think people like ghetto debugging? Well, I think it's because you don't have to navigate an interface, right? It's like, I know the piece of information I want, so let me just put it in the log statement. I don't have to like, go twirling through things, right? The, the flip side is you have to know in advance what you want. So that's what's kind of the idea behind Theseus, and I think you know, this is like what some of the other DevTool stuff is doing, and this kind of omniscient debugging thing that's been around, I think it's been in the Java world for a while, um, is that you don't have to think in advance about what information you need. You just get it, and you can get it afterwards. You just sort of use it, and then you figure it out. And I think that's a really powerful paradigm. The problem is that it has to capture lots and lots of data, so it would be interesting to see that go farther. Uh, another thing to Remy's point is, and uh, this is something Theseus does, and I think other things do, is I think there's actually a lot of power in building debugging tools through instrumentation, right? Is that you instrument, you instrument the JavaScript and you can, you know, like promises, you could instrument the promises library and, and figure that stuff out. So actually having like a common library for doing that kind of instrumentation for debugging, just purely in JavaScript without requiring browser support would be kind of nice. And Theseus has, I think, the beginning of that. It has like a generic instrumentation library. I think uh, aliens are trying to contact us. But we'll, just, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just ignore it for ignore now. Them. I, I, wonder, is it, I wonder if it's entirely the, the, the UI thing. I mean, it, it reminds me of a, um, an argument I got into at school, and it was it, you know, typical of my sense of humor, this, but it, it was about urinals, and I pointed out that the design flaw of urinal is that they lend themselves to a certain amount of splashback. And I said, this is something we should fix. And, and he said to me, no, no, like, if you don't get the splashback, how can you tell you're pissing hard like a real man? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is someone who doesn't enjoy being showered with his, with his own effluent, but he finds it, it, it affirms his masculinity. And, and it, is, is that what we're seeing with, with console.log? Is, is, you know, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm just using the bare minimum of the tools to prove I'm a great coder. I'm not going to use all of the, 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 you know, it's proving I'm not a good coder if I have to use all of the browser's help. I, I'm going to stop using console.log. I don't know. I'm just yeah. <laughs> from now on. <laughs> I don't know what this console log thing is. You know, there's Alert, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> Maybe that's a good time to move on to the... Oh, no, we've got, got a question in the audience. One thing, so I like the urinal. Uh, <laughs> I think another part is the, uh, is the element of uh, asynchronicity. So it's, sometimes it's quite hard to know when what all the things are triggered in. So if you've got events and things like that, and we find that often that is just makes it easier to see the flow the sequence of things. So maybe it's the uh, element of everything. A lot of things are in synchronous in the browser, mm. and that it's hard to visualize that and to reason about that. Is there a way to make that better in the tools? Would it, wouldn't it be nice to have kind of this map where you can see the <laughs> <laughs> flow in the yeah. browser? I don't know. I mean, that is an interesting thing about the flow-based approach. I mean, there's been flow-based programming languages for a long time, um, but it's kind of interesting to me that we haven't seen it for JavaScript. And when you're dealing with large amounts of asynchronous, I mean, this is the number one source of bugs I think we have in brackets in general is just dealing with asynchronous crap, right? And so having visual ways to trace that stuff is really important. So Theseus does a little bit of that, but 
yeah, I mean, I one thought here, what good. if we enable on a platform level like new development approaches like this to surface up, right? What if we allowed ex external developers to build new kind of tools for the platform so it wouldn't only be the DevTools teams? We, we do have a question about that coming up, so we'll, we'll say that now. We've got a question at the back. No, it's just an extension on the same thing, really. I, I find for mobile development, a lot of the time I don't want to jump into the DevTools because I'm working on a very fine grain, something to do with focus and blur events or um, touch start and, and various things like that. And jumping into DevTools actually interrupts that flow. So having being able to look back in as to what's happened in the last 10 seconds would be really useful. So this is that kind of thing built into DevTools, just a snapshot of what has just happened. Have yeah, any of you guys looked now. into initial That's why I don't use debugger a lot of the time. Mm. Yeah. In the dev tools, have you guys thought about looking into that? Like capturing state? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, outside of dev tools, tracing has this feature. Mm -hmm. It can record what's happening and it shows you a sliding window of what's just happened. Uh, it is not uh, traced into the uh, content world though, so we, we don't operate nodes and, and JavaScript there. And uh, in dev tools, we haven't started doing anything. We'll move on to the next topic. Uh, we've got a question from <coughs> Connell. Uh, where, where are you? Microphone for that now. Uh, hi. There are lots of uh, deprecated APIs and bad pr practices that browsers could detect uh, and warn about. How can tools guide developers towards better code without expecting uh, developers to run a, sp a specific profiler or manually interpret the results? I, I really liked uh, Firebug for this actually because it had always always visible a little error counter at the bottom and and knowing that other Firebug users would see that sort of spurred me on. I, I don't <laughs> want errors on my page because imagine the shame of it, you know. <laughs> uh, is, is this a useful pattern? Uh, so yeah, so one of the things that we are putting serious thought into doing is to splitting the web console in two. So one part of it would be logging mm. and one part of it would be JavaScript. Um, and then so we're putting lots and lots of extra warnings into the console at the moment. There are, there are all sorts of security things, like there are cores, errors in there, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and I think we should be having more of them. And that basically encompasses what you're saying. But it's going to make a complete mess of the web console if we do that. So we have two panels. That's what we're doing. I say that's what we're doing. That's what we're probably planning to do. We're, you know, we, we've not, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not code yet. That's what. Plans. We are not quite splitting the consoles, but we are also working on more warnings on uh, uh, deprecations, and not only deprecations, but the performance issues and potential bottlenecks for everything. I would, uh, I would love to see some linting tools built into the dev tools that, is c that are contextual, right? So while the app is running, then it could detect, hey, this API is being used, it's deprecated, this CSS is like this, so they hey, you're doing something for, that is causing jank. That would be nice to have an ongoing checklist of seeing stuff, right? Instead of just a warning in a console. Uh, right, so um, one of the things we have, uh, I think, right now on Firefox OS is um, uh, on top of the display, on top of your web page, mm. you get a little, a little thing floating over the top which tells you about JavaScript, tells it tells you about jank, tells you about that sort of thing. Um, there's a bunch of little cool. things that will do that. So there's also a lot of things could be done using instrumenting code. We have an, uh, a protocol API that allows installing a preprocessor that would uh, instrument all the content JavaScript and uh, trace it, log it, and do whatever you want <coughs> with it. So we expect a lot of innovation to come from there, from the outside, that would we analyze and promote to the tool itself. Is that shipping already? Uh, it is. It is there for quite some time. Do we, do we see that y users aren't? Um, because we've, we've got tools like Timeline, uh, you know, Kai has, um, uh, Chrome has as well. Are we, are we seeing users use that, or, or are we, do we want to be in a better position where we're, we want to tell people, hey, you have layout thrashing going on, without them having to go to that and like, say, look, this is what layout thrashing is, this is how you can find out where it's happening. But we, we know, just from a small little test, it is happening. It wasn't the question, it was the answer, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can we have that? And when can we have it? <laughs> No, but I, I, I think that is the solution to, to proper bit performance, better information to developers, just like why slow did it for, for, for bit performance, right? That you had, a, most of us just want to have a checklist to see, hey, I need to have complete these 500 issues of what I have in my app, and then I'm good, right? Yeah, we do want to make timeline more popular. We want to draw attention to it, and we will do that, and you'll see warnings. Excellent, cool. Right, uh, we'll move on to the next question. This is from Kyle Simpson. Uh, where's Kyle? Okay, over there, my Kyle. Uh, hi, 
All right, uh, so disclosure of bias. A couple of years ago, I worked with Joe Walker on the Firefox developer tools team, so uh, you just have to keep that in mind when I ask these questions. First uh, is, what's stopping every browser from providing headless access and automation, kind of like Phantom JS, but for testing and processing? And that's not just JavaScript, that's the entire stack with HTML and CSS, but mm. sort of headless into the tools. So this shifts us away from what's happening in the browser to happening outside the browser. Bubble, Joe, ship it. Um, <laughs> so the very short answer to your question is nothing. Um, what's stopping us? Nothing. Um, there's, no, there's, a, there's a fireback question, which is what, what actually do you want from headless? Is this, yeah, what, what's, the, what's the question behind it? I want Phantom JS, but I want it from the browser itself. I don't want to have some fork other project. I want to be able to spin up kind of like a UI web view. So it's, Firefox okay. And a UI web view so it's testing. Some other tool to do testing, regression, performance, all Right, stuff. okay. Um, so yes, there is uh, Slimer.js, which is basically this sort of thing. It's not 100% headless. It's nearly headless. Um, um, it's kind of maybe here. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I mean, that, that's as much as I can say. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of out of my depth here a bit because this is, a lot of this, it, the answer to this question is kind of like deeper browser engineering than as DevTools engineering. Um, we've had new APIs recently that look like they sh that should make this a lot easier, and I'm fairly sure that Slimer is working on those APIs. Um, so that's all I, I have more. Yeah, we have uh, a new version of uh, WebDriver is implemented on top of the DevTools protocol, so you can actually drive things in mm -hmm. the browser. And uh, there's also a telemetry API that allows headless operation, and that's actually how Chrome team is uh, uh, testing against regressions. So whenever you have a content that you don't want to regress in scrolling, you're using telemetry to implement a perf test for it. So it is there, it is publicly available, you can use it, but it's not standardized, and it's Chrome. But, I mean, WebDriver is enough of a standard, right? I mean, does, does that inside Firefox now? Some internal Firefox tests use that. Um, so that's becoming more of a cross-browser standard. Right. Um, so, I mean, let me come back to your, you know, why headless? You, you, you want to be able to run it without touching it, as opposed to you don't want to see it, right? Because nearly headless is OK if, if it's not a visual problem. If, if what you want is automated testing, you don't matter if the screen flicks briefly. Um, so there is the testing side of it. Right. There's the testing side of it, but there's also a functionality side of it. People use Phantom JS to spin up a headless browser that they can render screenshots from or things like that. That's the sort okay. of thing I'm talking about, being able yeah. to, um, in the build process, spin up a tool <coughs> for regression testing or pulling out rendering yeah. or analyzing the way things are working, all those yeah. sorts of things. And part of the problem really is, is that Phantom JS is not, you know, you think it's Chrome or something, but it's not. You know, it's kind of Chrome from a few years ago with some other weird right. bits and minus that. And, Yes, I think I think it would be nice if we were better at that. Um. I want to point out that developer tools actually do matter here because when you do this for the testing purposes, a lot of times you want to extract information that mm. would be available in developer tools as a part of those components. Because if this is a part of your test cycle, right. you might want to audit that things did not happen, trace, you know, do other right. things. Yeah, yeah. So it should be a part of that API. Yeah. Was well, that something that remote debug would be able to help? If we had a headless version of, of these browsers, could could then. Um, I, I, I see that as a natural extension, right? If we had a generic interface to the browser, no matter if it had this instance of Chrome or Safari, uh, then we would, we would be able to interface with the browser. We would, would be able to take a tool like Chrome's telemetry and use it across browsers to do comparison of browser performance. Um, it would enable a different generation of tools as I see it, and things that we now do specific to PhantomJS and specific to Slimer. Um, I just want to, to interface with the browsers. And WebDriver is not enough because WebDriver is focused only on automated testing. I want to get the information about timeline events and all of these other things that the, that the browser currently has, right? We have a question from the audience over here. This is more a user perspective kind of question, but with window.error being so flaky, is it possible for like the browsers, for the dev tools, when they record an error, to actually like ping an endpoint somewhere which would so you might specify in the head this you know, on error ping um, my server with the error details in the stack trace. 
So that way, if there is a complete JS failure due to cause or some other unseen event, that you would have an automated kind of, the browser would tell you this and kind of give you user metrics mm. and statistics. Thank you. So you want to get that information from the field or you want to be things when you're running locally? I didn't get that. No, so say, say you've, um, you've um, we had an error where we put cross-origin anonymous on a Google Maps script and basically Google deployed a new version of Maps which completely broke all the JavaScript, nothing would run. So there was no error reporting, no nothing, because the basic Chrome said, we don't want to run this because it's, if there's right. a security error. So would it be possible for the browser to actually ping, so say if you had like a meta tag, say, on error ping mm, my yeah. error reporting, and basically you'll just send the stack trace. Isn't there a spec this, around this? This, um, is, well, this is one of the things that, that native people say, native is way better than the web at this, it's getting metrics on what the hell's going on out there. Um, we should be better at this. Um, well, this goes I back to the I point before about like, do we do we build features that have debugging built into them? I mean, we saw that, that promises didn't, but uh, I think what you're referring to is CSP has has a specific feature True, for, yeah. for logging back. Yeah, do we need something like that for for, for error logging? Mm. Yeah, question from the audience, sir. Um, yeah, just sorry, back to that. Uh, what, what's actually your problem with window on error? Because. At the Guardian, we do exactly what you say, and we it works perfectly. And no, we but like, say if there's a cause error, that wouldn't be reported on Windows on error. So you would never, you would never get that. So basically, right. say if you deploy the script and you forgot the headers, the window on error would never report to you that you've had a cause error. Yeah, yeah, so, or, yeah, so yeah. Or like if you're, if basically say um, you managed to put, um, you missed the colon in your window error <coughs> statement or something, and that would break your reporting tool. So something, yeah. something to pipe what you would see as an error in console. Yeah. What's that to yes. server? The whole of your lint panel. To redirect the whole of that lot back to you, you know yes. that would mm. so that seems like, like oh, a reasonable. It's very flaky and it doesn't really work most yeah. of the time. So it'd be quite handy to have just a meta tag which would like tell you what, what was going on. I feel like there's there could be some privacy issue yeah. or something. Yeah. I <laughs> you need to think about it, but <laughs> uh, well, even, even if it kind of went through like Google and then they like anonymized it and you got it like. Oh, no, so is this helping <laughs> privacy <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> scary? <laughs> A question at the front here. We'll get a microphone. Hi, so I kind of tried to push around WSBC as the performance of the tooling group to do exactly what you guys were talking about. It's great to create a Chrome like has this implementation and telemetry APIs. So my question is more as a call to action. So I tried to push it in the group, but so far in both of those groups, the tooling group and the web performance group, so, but in, so, now, so far nobody was really interested in going forward with this, if you guys have it, and why just don't put a first version together of what we all have there and try to draft of what can be standardized or what cannot be standardized and start working on it? I think we're just waiting for it to prove itself usable and user-friendly. And for now we're just innovating and moving rapidly there. And uh, so we just need time, and we need more initiative from you, <coughs> from your side, more pushing for it. That was my first way of pushing you, so <laughs> I'll go ahead there. Well, we're going to move on to our, to our last question, which is a good question to end on, and it's from Remy Sharp again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we can get Remy a microphone. Strap it to him. Uh, okay, so I'd like to contribute to developer tool. I would like contributing to developer tools to be made easier. Um, not just adding a panel or tweaking current, uh, but tweaking, yeah, tweaking functionality. How can I get involved? And I, I had originally tacked on this. Things like Grease Monkey made it very, very easy to, to hack the page and make it uh, improve for me as the, 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 the visitor or the user or the developer. Um, I'd like to see that kind of like super low barrier of entry for all of the dev tools, except for Apple, because they don't play ball. <laughs> <laughs> Jake and me spent an hour yesterday making all these questions really short. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what do we need to, if, if a uh, developer wants to get involved in, in Chrome DevTools, what, what can they do? We are not particularly good at that. So uh, if you want <laughs> to uh, contribute to Core DevTools, uh, the entry bar is fairly high, because we are a part of Blink source tree. So it, it's not good. The extensions uh, API is not rich enough for your needs, right? And it's not rich for, for a reason. We don't want people to fight for resources and break each other. So uh, we're just trying to get better at that. 
and in both ways, in contributing to core and uh, providing more richer extensions APIs. But for now, you, you get a wiki or something, you follow the instructions and you manage to put a patch. We feel a bit sorry for you, but that's about it for Chrome <coughs> as of today. So uh, it's bad. So we, we can do, I mean, I mean, Firefox, you can hack anything on it, you can, you know, it's all JavaScript in our dev tools, so you, you, there isn't a limit to what you can do. The downside is next month it will break. Um, uh, we are trying to create some APIs that are more standardized that won't break. Um, and we spent some time with the Ember guys working out what they would like, and we've done stuff to, with Angular to try and you know, have custom extensions there. Um, if there's something that we're doing that you that is not doesn't help you, then shout to us and we'll. It, thing is, that's that's more kind of like high level developer. The experienced developer can do that kind of thing. I'm I'm talking about uh, Grease Monkey is a really good example. People could just pick up a Grease Monkey script right. and install it for themselves to make. I I, I make my banking site right. readable using Grease Monkey. Yeah. I want to be able to do that with like dev tools. Like like being able to bump the font was a huge deal for me because I don't like tiny fonts, and now right. de like both Firefox and Chrome do it. But before I had to tweak a style sheet, which was a little bit more of a barrier of entry, it's okay. kind of making that an So you want, you want a Grease Monkey script to plug into DevTools in effect, S that kind of Sort of, thing. Of, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about kind of the low barrier of entry, yeah. really, to make it easy for anyone here to, to, to make their DevTools better. Right. Would you, so, would you want a better deployment for it, or you want it for yourself? I, for myself, because yeah, once you kind of go right, here's Grease Monkey access type access, then yeah, it's going to be a complete cluster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm talking about for the individual to be able to hack their own dev tools. So, so what we have? I got an example where that is useful. In Yaml, for example, I wanted to fix things and make comps and make Photoshop things, and never had anything work. But when I wrote a Grease Monkey script and mm -hmm. sent people the link, all of a sudden they saw the page change and basically interact with the change already. Right. So a scriptable interface to the developer tools would allow me to do that as well. We don't want to reinvent Grease Monkey, but yep. making it as easy to show what a debugging step would look like or a tutorial how debugging works in yep. a JavaScript way of scripting the dev tools would be really, really useful. So w one thing we're trying to do, um, this is a road, and we're some way down this road. What would be very cool is if you could simply um, clone a repo on Git, which is our dev tools, um, and you could now say in your browser, don't look inside yourself, look over there, and it's all just tech files. We're not, I'm, actually there's quite a few bits of that that work already. Like you can already say, don't look inside yourself, look there. Mm, yeah. um, it's not a separate reason. You can already do that with um, Chrome today, point to another folder. Yeah. Yeah. Chrome has it for, for a couple of years, but it's not sort of getting traction. It uses, it, it helps the adoption, it helps uh, getting more contributors, because it's easier to set up that environment and hack on that tools. But people don't use it for like on a regular basis. It's just too inconvenient. Well, did you but it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. It, 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 it's it there. It, 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 it has been uh, advertised quite some uh, when the remote debugging appeared because remote debugging was proved by the uh, external front end running as a web page externally. But we could I mean, we could do something like that. Yeah, because that, that's a be. big starting step. Being able to just say, okay, instead of loading up the internal dev tools, point it to the, the copy that I've got, right. and then I can start hacking. You have a button in dev tools that's like fork dev tools, and it <laughs> spits all the code out for you in another directory, and you can edit yeah. it. Well, and that is us unfortunately out of time. I can see a lot of people have, have extra questions, but the very best of the people on this panel will be in the pub this evening. The people who go home early don't really care about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that brings us on to, onto a break, so you can uh, grab a coffee uh, before the next session, <coughs> which is build process. But uh, thank you very much uh, to the panelists.